In oncology specifically, one patient and his lovely wife were sitting in front of me and his disease was progressing. And he looked at me and said, Dr. Gomez, I got all the pain, but she got all the suffering. Mm. You know, and my, my lawyer friends use pain and suffering, you know, as lingo. And here was this mm-hmm. patient right before me using those words with the greatest wisdom. I got all the pain. She got all the suffering. Like what a gift to her as caregiver. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our show. This is Dr. Akita, and we have a fantastic guest today. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Christina Gomez. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to tell us a little about yourself and your journey to medicine. First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. Really, it's a gift to be here. Um, they say medicine is really just experience, but it's it's full circle moment to be able to be to be with you all tonight, right? Whoever's out there, uh, med students, pre med students, we're really a tribe or a community. Uh, unique in, in, and yet so very different. But this is a full circle moment for me. So my name is Christy Gomez or Christina Gomez. I'm a GI medical oncologist. I'm at Banner MD Anderson in Phoenix. My journey has been everything I dreamed. That's a big statement, but I think I was born to do this at five. I mentioned I wanted to to be a physician to my parents. I said, I wanted to be a doctor. There were no doctors in the family, but I was five and that never wavered. And so I, I'm one of the lucky ones I know that knew then and is able to do today, every day, what I dreamed of as a kid. So so I get it that I'm the lucky one that, that kind of knew, but no matter what, right? Wherever we find it, the fact that we're able to do it in wherever the journey begins. But I was born and raised in Miami and I stayed home for most of my training. Went to med school, internship, stayed there for chief residency, through residency. And then I knew the community. I knew the hospital. It felt like home and I stayed there for fellowship. So 11 years at the same place. That was at uh, University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital. And then I did a little bit of work um, in Fort Lauderdale, and that was great. Getting to know the community, that's where I got a chance to focus my oncology into GI. And one of my mentors was up at Yale and recruited me to do a little bit of teaching. And I think that's why tonight is special for me, because it's going back to, to academics in a, in a more casual setting. But, but passing the baton or, or you know, uh, looking back and talking to to all of us at different stages. So I was at Yale and I did GI med a little bit of teaching medical students at different ages, did healers art out there, which was dear to my heart, which I hope we get into it a little bit more with Rachel Naomi Remen, Dr. Remen uh, and her book. Then that same mentor went cross country uh, to Phoenix, Arizona, here at Banner MD Anderson. And a few years later recruited me here I've been here two and a half years and I'm really happy, really happy with the desert. So, but more than that, <laughs> I'm able to focus my interests in GI Medonk. I love that. And I absolutely love your energy and your enthusiasm. You had this dream since you were five years old, like literally, <laughs> and it came true. And it's so refreshing to hear a physician that is living her dream and living her passions, because I think a lot of our guests, like we know the state of healthcare in America isn't the best. So sometimes physicians get on and they're like, oh, I don't know. And in which there are pluses and minuses, but I just love like your energy and enthusiasm for serving patients. Thank you for that. Because Dr. Akita, when I was about to get into it, maybe college, pre-med, everyone knew medicine was changing. Healthcare was changing. Healthcare policy was changing. Reimbursements were changing. Forget costs of oncology drugs. I mean, that was way down the line. But, but I remember being at parties, cocktail parties with my parents and people discouraging me, almost, you know, beginning the conversation of don't do it. It's going to change. It's not what you think. And I thought, wait, I don't, I don't have those preconceived notions, but I remember that. And so I guess. 
I pray a message we take home here is if it's yours, if it's the calling, if it doesn't go away, if it doesn't waver, you know, stick to it. It's not for everyone, right? This is a crazy lifestyle. I was just sharing with you that I, I got someone to, to cover me in the clinic and I got someone to pick up my son from school. And because this is important, because this is part of medicine. So it's not for everyone, but if it's for you, anyone out there, if it's for you, you can make it happen. And there's something else I remember at the very beginning of med school that I knew and I'm seeing now with my colleagues that we can make medicine or our lives, our careers look like whatever we wanted to. Right now I'm exploring physician authors or there's people who are doing part-time work or other things in their lives like that we are really multifaceted people. So I thank you for picking up on my passion, but I think it's because I remained true to that, that if it's for you, like you can make it look like you, whatever you want it to look like, right? Your career, you could be an author, you could be a teacher, you could be a researcher, you could do lab and clinical work. You could do only clinical work. I've got patients who are doing, or physician friends who are doing pharma and, and research business models, like AI stuff, so that clinical trials can get to the right people. What I mean is, if you love it, don't let it go. I love that. And, and and it couldn't be true. Like if it's for you, it's for you. And and you'll figure out a way. I definitely love that you mentioned that you kind of can make healthcare the way that you want to do and, and treat people the way that you want to treat. And you've talked about your journey as to how you went to school and kind of stayed in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. And then you kind of moved and navigated out. And as you were having your journey through that career of medicine, you were also kind of evolving as an oncologist and taking on GI oncology and things like that. And one thing that I always find so fascinating about oncologists, because I'm a family, a primary care doctor, is you guys are just so happy. <laughs> it's like, it kind of is counterintuitive. So I know that that as a GI oncologist, like you are at patients with some of their, mo during some of their most intimate moments. So there's kind of an art to giving bad news. And of course, we have we have good news, too, in oncology, but, but sometimes we have to have those difficult conversations. What advice do you have to students who are at the beginning of their career who may be just starting to talk with patients in terms of giving bad news? So that's a wonderful question. And I think I want to answer it in twofold. What I learned in my journey. One is that patients really want to know. And as a med student, I thought, no way. They don't want to know the prognosis. They don't want to know that the studies say 18 months. They don't want to know that the new drug only bought us two months overall survival compared to placebo or to the standard of care. But I learned in my career or through my last 10, 15 years, patients want to know and they'll ask you. And it is our privilege and our honor and our task and our baton. It's our mic, right? To say and be truth sayers and say, listen, this only bought us a few months, but it could buy you the few months that you wish. So one, patients want to know and go there. I invite you in bad news to go there. If the patient leads, patient wants to go there, go there with them. And two is what I learned through all of this, where medicine is going and we continue to be forever students, right? That, that silence is powerful and loud and is a way to communicate with our patients. And so practicing the pause or the silence and for us to practice it in our own lives so we're not afraid of it at the clinic, right? In the exam room with patients and their families, that silence allows those words to settle or the reality or the questions to arise or the tears or the acceptance or the decision to come. So those are my two things. One, go there with the patient if they ask the tough questions. 
that we be ready to go there. And two, be comfortable with the silence. That silence too has a role in not only our words, but our silence can heal. I couldn't agree more that sometimes that silence that just gives people a sense of comfort and that you do want to know a lot of times you would think that you wouldn't, but it can help people prioritize what is important to them and, and to get that quality of life that they want to live. So it's very important to, to not hold back and respect people and respect their wishes and respect their personal journeys. And, and it's a privilege to be a part of that experience with them. And I definitely know that you can identify with the privilege. And we talked about the silence. Now we want to talk about the words <laughs> because you wrote a book called Stopped in My Tracks, a physician's collection of cancer patient quotes. So we want to hear what they said. <laughs> so is there a particular quote that kind of stands out to you? Oh, so many. Dr. Akita, that was a great segue because we're trained. We're trained and we have well, we pray, right? We pray that we have the gift of word in this, right? And we pray that we can send the message to our patients, the good and the bad news, the science and the art of what we do. But what I learned is that uh, instead of jotting down pearls of knowledge, like I was trained in med school to do, right? To, to write down the things I saw at the bedside. What I started jotting down were their very quotes and they literally stopped me in my tracks. I remember pausing and asking them to uh, say it again, repeat those words. And I caught myself writing it down on the exam room tissue or a, a paper towel. And so you ask. And so I wrote this book and it's a collection of these quotes. I was able to publish them. And let's see what stands out. In oncology specifically, one patient and his lovely wife were sitting in front of me and his disease was progressing. And he looked at me and said, Dr. Gomez, I got all the pain, but she got all the suffering. Mm. You know, and my, my lawyer friends use pain and suffering, you know, as lingo. And here was mm -hmm. this patient right before me using those words with the greatest wisdom. I got all the pain. She got all the suffering. Like, what a gift to her as caregiver that he recognized her. Let's see. There's so many more. A young woman saying, my breasts betrayed me. First, they fed my children. But now I got breast cancer. Another breast cancer patient, this was before I was in GI Medonk. She said to me, my skin after radiation looks like dragon skin. And Dr. Arkita, I was raising a little boy who had dragon pajamas and dragon movies and I got it, right? She told me in new light all about the scaliness or the dryness or the discomfort to her skin. But she didn't say that. She said, I have dragon skin. And as a mom of a young little boy, you know, I, I got it. And now we're forever teachers, right? Doctor means teacher. So I tell my patients undergoing radiation, hey, the skin could get really dry and scaly like that of a dragon's, right? So the patients taught me, and those are just a few, and we can go into a few more, but that's what happened in the exam room. It's what happens every day. And I find that so powerful because when people are going through these situations and they're there to seek help, because like you said, like doctor means teacher, but a lot of times they teach you, like they teach you to pause in the moment, to be thankful, to kind of, reflect on like how you would want to be told something or even like you said how to describe something so I don't know what happened to that patient or how long ago you saw them but she lives on like through her quotes that you're teaching other people about these experiences so it's something that will stay with you forever. I think so I, I, I never imagined this but I, I wrote it in I think the afterward that this book became almost like a how-to Dr. Rikita, you, you just touched on something that we don't talk about enough or I don't talk about it enough. It's a how-to to cancer, too. So some of them talked about how the neuropathy in their mouth felt like pop rocks or the neuropathy mm -hmm. in their feet felt like they were walking on bubble wrap 
right, with their feet wrapped in bubble wrap. Or another patient talked about how everything tasted like sawdust because chemotherapy and its associated dysgeusia, a how-to to cancer with side effects, but a how-to to embrace this. Many of the patients said, you know, what are you waiting for, doc? I'm only 79. Here I was hemming and hawing and weighing her decision because I didn't want the toxicity to outweigh the benefit. And and she said, what are you waiting for? I'm only 79. And, you know, you asked about legacy. She did awesome. Years later, she was still cancer free. Since then, I've left and I've, I've lost touch because I left Connecticut. But and lastly, there, there's that, right, that I got the privilege of jotting these these uh, quotes and now it's been a gift to family members who remain. I have spouses who said, I'll treasure this book because her words are memorialized even though she's no longer at my side. So I thank you for, for picking up on that as, as a gift of, of this book, Stopped in My Tracks, because they're still stopping me in my tracks when the husband said that after her passing. It is such a gift and I love, I wanted to kind of go back to what we were talking about a little earlier when you gave your introduction and you talked about your journey and how you kind of, you you trained and, and you had participated in healer's art. And we had a healer's art at my medical school. And for the students who may not be familiar with that, I'd love for you to explain it. But it seems like it was kind of also like some kind of like healing process for you to to write this book and have that connection. So it was a full circle moment. First year medical school, I was handed a book, Kitchen Table Wisdom, by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, a physician and, and, and mentor of sorts for me. She was at UCSF and she wrote the book and she's written others, my grandfather's blessings. But Kitchen Table Wisdom was granted or gifted to all of us in the med school class. And she talked about the encounter between patient and physician as meeting at the kitchen table and it's a collection of stories of, of her patients. Full circle moment is when I was faculty at Yale that they were hosting the healer's art course, Dr. Remen's course that started in San Francisco and was actually brought to Yale by our now Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. So full circle, wow. first year medical student and when I became faculty, and now full circle or an opportunity to talk about that and how mm -hmm. the healing for me was using patients' own quotes. It was definitely an antidote to burnout for me. Again, we can jot down all these things that we can look up in textbooks or online, but we can't forget what patients say. And it was there that I found the art of medicine, right? And I think I talk about that in the introduction, that we're committed to the science, where we made a vow to it. But medicine without science is only 50%. It's flat that medicine is truly an art. So for me, healer's art, of course, uh, was that reminder. And then documenting these words, quotes. They weren't just the chief complaints like we're taught to write at the top of a note. These were different quotes that really healed me, right? Like, slow down, doc. You'll live longer. Or my very young patient with advanced gastric cancer, like we're seeing epidemiologically right now, younger and younger people with GI cancers. This young woman was in her young, in her thirties. And she said to me, look, doc, don't worry. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just changing. Here's the patient teaching me, quoting science, but purest art about the afterlife or spirit or energy that remains or legacy. So that's a little bit of the history. And I quote or I bow to Dr. Remen and uh, almost as a mentor to say, don't forget to listen to the patients, right? That we get, I think she said, front row seats to their journey and to be able to listen to them, right? Medicine 101, my friends, is to listen to the patient there's everything. The answer to what we need, decision to which treatment they want, the way they want to embrace their illness, and the way they want us to journey with them. So 
to Remen to Healer's Art and then to Stopped in My Tracks. Uh, Dr. Akita, I have to thank you for kind of interweaving all of that uh, or bringing it up here. Thank you for sharing all of your words of wisdom. I think that this is an episode where all of the listeners out there, regardless of what stage of being in medicine you're in, whether or not you're at the very beginning where you're thinking about becoming a physician and you're taking the exams and learning all of the admissions and listening to those episodes that we have on that, or you're already a student and you're in the depths of it, like learning how to interview a patient or doing that clinical part where you're trying to get to interviewing a patient or you're thinking about residency and those types of things. Like this is something that we kind of always need to think about in terms of, like you said, like a remedy for burnout. And we love to talk about finding our why, like when we're doing applications for medical school and for residency and fellowship and beyond, you kind of harp on like your personal statement and all of those kinds of things and in times get hard. And we talk about kind of thinking back and looking and rereading your personal statement so you can kind of remind yourself why you got into this place. But you have another thing you can look back at your book and, and it may be something that people may want to adopt in terms of taking these memorable moments and kind of writing them down or these memorable quotes. I know when I get together with some of my old friends from med school or my old friends from residency recently did that. And it's kind of like, hey, you remember this patient or you remember this experience? And and it kind of just all comes back, even though it's been like so many years. And you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about them. Yes. So having that to kind of reflect on it, I mean, that's good. So good. And you're so right. Just talking or sharing these quotes brings them back. And what a tribute. And so I think that's the best way that we teach each other. I pray that my book is like a how-to or a support group for other patients, for medical students um, to look at that and say, oh, this is about listening deeply to the patients. Absolutely. And one of my final questions I have, because we're coming to a close, is something that I love to ask mostly all of my guests because we get so many different answers. We all know that the healthcare system has room for improvement, is not perfect. So if you had a magic wand and there was something you could change about the US healthcare system, what would it be? So that's a big question, but I think I have to bow to saying time, right? I, I If I had a magic wand, that there'd be time because that's all the patients ask of us. And that's all that we need right? To put it all together, time to think, time to discuss with our colleagues, time to document. Uh, but all the patients are asking for is time with them. And guys, not measuring that in minutes, but in the quality of the minutes, because you'll see in your training, right? Some things need 45 minutes and an hour, but other things don't. If your presence, your listening, your radical listening, or your empathic listening or your presence is fully there. So magic wand, what does healthcare need? It needs time. So we need time for the research to unfold and we need that time to be sped up so that trials come to the bedside, but time for us with the patients, with our documents, seeing with our time to think, time to round, time with our families, Time with ourselves. So magic wand. And I, this just came and I'm, I think I'm, I'm happy with my answer is uh, medicine needs time. So the physician needs time, right? Physician heal thyself, but the patients need our time. And so do our families, right? Our families or our pets, our parents. So magic wand time. I love that. Thank you. I'm jotting it down myself here. Time. <laughs> I absolutely love that answer. To be honest, I've been doing this show for <laughs> probably, I've probably been doing this show for a little over two years or so. And you're the first person that said time, but it's so true. It's, <laughs> it's true. The world would be so much different if we had time and in terms of so many realms of healthcare and personal life. So Dr. Akita, a patient once told me we can make time. So, you know, it, it, the magic one, maybe it's, it's, it's in our hands to make time. But I'm sorry, there was a, a delay there and, and I interrupted you. Go ahead. 
Oh, no, it's okay. I was just thanking you for making the time to come on our show. You shared so many pearls of wisdom that I'm sure you have so many more to share with us. We'll probably have to invite you back. But I want to give you an opportunity to let the listeners know where they can find you, where they can find our book and, and give you an opportunity to say goodbye. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. I'm honored. It's my favorite group to speak to. Pre-med students, med students, house staff, know that you are part of a larger community. I'm Christina Gomez. ChristinaGomezMD.com is my website. My book is Stopped in My Tracks. You can buy it on the website. There's a few links. It's on Amazon, but it's also on Itasca, which is the distributor, maybe more direct. ChristinaGomezMD.com stopped in my tracks. And I can only pray that medicine stops you in your tracks, that it makes it and makes your life more meaningful, more rich, and that you never forget why you're doing this and that the patients really are our teachers. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us. For all of the students who are listening, be sure to share this episode. I think that it's something that we can all appreciate across the board. And if you have any questions or any recommendations for any future topics or guests, feel free to reach out to me on my LinkedIn or Kita DeRowan or on Instagram, Dr. D Graham, D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D-G-R-A-M, and we'll get back to you. See you again next week with another wonderful guest. Bye. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward med school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.